So my paper, I suppose most naturally relates to the first two in this session, look, talking about working with military veterans in archaeology. Um, I, uh, in, in putting my PowerPoint together, I gave serious consideration to printing off and laminating two pieces of paper, one with I'm not a psychologist and one with I'm not a military veteran. Uh, partly because, you know, cheat jokes in conferences always uh, uh, wins the day. But actually there's a, there's a serious point that the, uh, there's a lot of work being done increasingly with, with military veterans in archaeology. Um, and there are a lot of people are doing really good work, really important work with it. But there's also a danger, I think, that people that aren't uh, necessarily appropriately qualified um, are getting involved. And I think we need to be up front when we talk about military veterans and archaeology in saying, this is my skill set, this is what I can talk about. So this is mostly, I suppose, a reflective um, presentation. Um, I uh, want to start by providing a little bit of, sort of socio-historical um, context in terms of the, the care of veterans in the UK um, before I move on to um, the, uh, the um, uh, rehabilitation archaeology initiatives. So, you know, for a long time, obviously, there, there was no social support at all for, um, for service personnel. Um, and uh, perhaps not unrelated to uh, the, the English Civil War in the mid 17th century, King Charles II recognised a uh, perhaps a political as much as a moral um, dimension in supporting um, uh, army veterans. Um, and there's an interesting uh, line from the, uh, the, the warrant uh, of, uh, that established the Greenwich Hospital veterans, uh, recognising the plight of those broken by age or war and their social responsibility uh, or state responsibility to provide care and support. And this was followed a few years later by the naval equivalent established by uh, William III and Mary II um, at the, uh, the Greenwich Hospital. And for a long time, that was more or less the extent of, of formal support for uh, former service personnel. There are lots of stories and, and accounts of, um, uh, of, of informal support through sort of local uh, village activities and church support, but nothing on a formal, um, uh, you know, wide scale or state level, really, for a long time. Um, and then uh, you kind of come into the mid 19th century in the UK, and obviously the, uh, the Crimean War. Um, and you're now into an age where you have a, a mass print media and stories of the, the, the huge losses, the terrible conditions in the Crimean War are reaching the, the public um, back home. And it's also, you know, it also coincides with that point in the mid 19th century where uh, Victorian, uh, the Victorian industrialists initially perhaps starting to focus on philanthropy as a way of giving back and of course a, a very... Um, church-focused morality coming into, into play as well. So it's around this time, perhaps all these things coming together, around this time that you see uh, schools established for the children of um, service personnel who were, were killed in conflict initially from Crimea, but, but uh, from that point onwards. Um, and then you have the, the Sailor's Rest, which was a, a temperance, um, you know, alcohol-free um, bars and hotels in effect. Um, established by um, Agnes Weston, uh, which is still running to this day. Um, and it sort of, it, it starts to develop, but not really at, at a great rate of knots. It's obviously um, the, the First World War, which is the big um, kind of game changer in, in all sorts of respects. Now, not only have you got uh, a, a modern mechanised war, um, you've also got uh, imp improvements in uh, healthcare, perhaps, so that you have huge numbers of men losing limbs, but also surviving those injuries and returning home. Um, almost, probably every family in Britain is in some way affected by a loss during the First World War. What's interesting, though, is that you also start to see the veterans themselves coming together to form their own, uh, what we would call now, you know, peer-to-peer -peer support groups. So you have things like the, the Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association, which was initially a regional thing, with regional offices, comes together um, later on to become a British uh, Blesma, a British organisation, which again is, is also still, still running and, and um, very successful, very important. Um, and then you have the, the, sort of the, the self-help groups in, 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 you know, con um, in different contexts, in a sense. 
So you have the Comrades of the Great War, the, the National Association of Discharged Sailors and Soldiers, uh, you know, etc. And actually these come together in 1921 to form the Royal British Legion, which um, certainly in the UK is probably what most people would think of as the archetypal sort of service charity, um, but actually formed from other, other groups coming together. Importantly, um, shortly after the First World War as well, you've also got the mental health um, impact becoming uh, far more, uh, far better understood perhaps. Now, although you've got guys being executed at the front for failing to, um, to uh, follow orders because of shell shock, um, there was a recognition back home that they weren't, these guys weren't cowards. They were, had been in some way mentally affected, uh, mentally stroke physically affected um, by what they'd been through. Um, and you have established the, the Ex-Servicemen's Welfare Society, which takes a very different approach from the others. So up to this point, it's been about you know, care for military veterans and all their families. Um, and now with this, uh, the Welfare Society, they set about creating work programmes, recuperation homes, where the guys that are recovering from shell shock, you know, what we now call PTSD, are able to uh, engage in work activities. Again, we come back to you know, the phrase that, that's come up I think, in, all, in all three of the previous papers, the sense of belonging, uh, a community, uh, a, a sense of um, value, perhaps. But of course, it's, you know, it's limited in scope, but it's a very, very important step forward um, in terms of social support for military veterans. This chapter, I should say, is actually still working as uh, now known as combat stress and again is one of the very important providers of support for um, British veterans. So, needless to say, there are a number of other charities established throughout the 20th century, um, uh, obviously um, folks around the Second World War in particular. But I want to sort of skip ahead to the, the, the recent past. Um, in the UK, I think, you know, I'm speaking as a, again, I'm not a veteran, okay, of my invisible placard up. Um, I, I'm, as a member of the public, um, I remember becoming very aware uh, in around 2007, maybe, um, give or take, anyway, um, of the, the scale of the, the losses and the casualties um, resulting from the uh, conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, and you've got to remember as well, this is the first time in, in perhaps a generation where the British military has been deployed and four years of sustained, um, uh, sustained major conflicts. Um, and our, our army isn't the size it used to be. Um, and the NHS, which is a, a wonder, you know, the National Health Service in the UK, which is a wonderful institution, doesn't have the, the capacity to cope with the sorts of casualties that were coming back to the UK. Um, and then at the same time as all that was becoming apparent, I think, uh, on, on a social level, you have things like uh, Wooden Bassett, where you had, um, it was just on the, on the route between the RAF base um, and where they were, where the, the, um, uh, the coffins were being um, taken to. And the local British Legion members used to come out and, and start off just by showing their respect, showing their respect, and they were joined by members of the local community, and that grew and it grew and it became as you can see from the photos, a, a massive affair. And this was just people wanting to show their uh, respect, their support, their, their grief, whatever. And this was all, this was around 2007. This was, was really um, you know, important display of social support for the military, and military veterans in particular, and casualties. So, you know, the seeds were sown, I think, around that time. So. By the end of 2007, you have the Charity Health for Heroes established, which gained, uh, gained the support of uh, major national newspapers, raised a phenomenal amount of money in a very short period of time, and was a big supporter, a big um, provider of, uh, of funds for all sorts of uh, charities providing support and care for military veterans. Um, Op Nightingale, Operation Nightingale, named after the nurse Florence Nightingale from uh, Crimea, was established uh, initially into the late 2011, initially focused on, on uh, currently serving personnel as a way of sort of measuring the effectiveness of archaeology in, in um, uh, helping 
guys recover from um, you know, a recent deployment, the decompression in effect. Uh, and then the focus shifted in, from around 2012 onto, onto more the, the veteran community. Um, Operation Nightingale is still active and current. It's, uh, it's more kind of an overseeing uh, ephemeral um, body. Um, but perhaps its biggest success was spawning uh, it, you know, its children, if you like, um, not least of which, of course, Breaking Ground Heritage, which we've um, heard about earlier. Um, the uh, American Veterans Archaeological Recovery in the middle, which began the life as Op Nightingale USA, very much following the same model as uh, Operation Nightingale. And of course, Warflow Uncovered was a big, um, uh, a big veteran archaeology project focused specifically on the battlefield at Waterloo. So between Op Nightingale and its offspring, if you like, um, hundreds of veterans um, have been given an opportunity to engage with archaeology and hopefully you know, benefit, uh, benefit from it. So, you know, why is archaeology so effective? Um, psychologists uh, such as uh, Nick Caddick at uh, Anglia Ruskin has written about the effectiveness of, of surfing um, and physical activity generally for veterans. You know, anecdotally, we describe archaeology perhaps by its defining characteristic, which is fieldwork. And as you know, Dicky and uh, and uh, I'm perfectly sorry, I've forgotten your name, Andres, Andres um, described. You know, the, it's that physical activity. It's being outdoors and being active, working as a, as a team. Success on an archaeological project naturally depends on teamwork. If you don't have a good team, the project doesn't work, or at least doesn't work as well as it should. And camaraderie, and particularly in the UK, I have to say, the weather means you need a good team spirit. Otherwise, it's a pretty miserable affair. Um, Fieldwork includes naturally hard physical outdoor work. It's, it's task and role orientated, which suits the guys, um, and it's naturally hierarchical as well. Even if um, you know, even if this is just by virtue of involving different levels of skills and experience. And I think finally, again, you know, in terms of the mindfulness thing, which has come through. Um, you now I've had students on my projects, and they talk about, oh, you know, training's boring. I hate it. You know. But actually, for, for some of these guys coming through uh, BGH or other initiatives, actually there's a sense of mindfulness that might come from trailing. What one person might find boring, someone else might find usefully distracting from, um, from um, everything that's going on. Um, so just to sort of, you know, I think there's some, there were some sort of flags that we need to be aware of, though. As I said, um, it is becoming increasingly popular, but it's so important to make sure that the right people are doing it. And, you know, what Dickie's described at BGH is, a, is an example of uh, the very best level um, that's being done in this area. But there are examples of shoddy work, and that doesn't benefit anybody. You have to wonder, and again, you know, this is something that we need data for, but you have to wonder if projects focused on battlefield sites are helping the guys move forward, or whether it's keeping them actually in, in, a, in a position of uh, defining themselves as a, a veteran or a soldier. Um, you know, do we need to think about prior screening? Um, does there need to be a greater uh, assessment of you know, people's issues in terms of being able to care for them appropriately on these projects? Um, and also, you know, on, a, on a project, it's great. You're on there, you're, you're distracted from the real world. There's a cliff edge that happens at the end of that. Um, which uh, needs thinking about. I'm just going to have to skip ahead slightly because I'm running out of time. But talk about rehabilitation. This is, you know, we're talking about enabling and supporting individuals uh, to achieve their full potential. And for some guys, that's sufficient. That's all they want from it. Others actually want to move on and, um, uh, and look at archaeology as a profession. Um, so I was uh, very fortunate. One of the few times I've been proud of my management at my university. Uh, when they agreed to fund uh, fee waiver studentships. We have horrific fees in the UK, um, and the university uh, has offered to fund up to five fee waiver studentships for military veterans studying archaeology with us. Um, we uh, uh, had an initial cohort of four, um, of which one unfortunately dropped out at the end of the first year because of uh, significant ongoing medical issues. But the other three, despite being told by their military careers advisors, archaeology is not for you, you need a degree for that, why not try gardening? Um, they're getting very good marks, high 2-1, uh, the occasional first, because 
they won't have the school qualifications, but they work bloody hard, and they are incredibly enthusiastic. And you cannot buy that. Um, you know, it'd be nice if all of our students felt the same. But these guys are role models for the normal route students around them, and you see their marks going up as well. It's it's a most definitely a win-win. And I think I'm pointing to wrap up there. Except just to add, finally, um, I was very fortunate to take three of our Winchester studentship holders out to my project in Georgia, summer before last, so 2017, and we were able to get some Georgian military veterans to join us as well. Um, so it was a fantastic opportunity to sort of introduce this idea of um, support for veterans and the benefits that can be achieved, and that's now sort of starting to grow into something bigger out in Georgia. So that was a fantastic experience. Thank you very much.